Hello everybody, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Asia Pacific 2023 Global AIDS Update Report Launch. My name is Cedrian Martin, I'm the Communications and Advocacy Advisor for the UNAIDS Regional Support Team that's based here in Bangkok. We're so pleased that you could join us in person here at the Foreign Correspondence Club and also online. So we are here to launch the UNAIDS new UNAIDS Global Report, The Path That Ends AIDS. And in the AIDS response, we talk so much about ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. And the point of this report is that this is not just a slogan. This is not just an empty wish. It is actually achievable, but in order to achieve it, we have to attend to many moving parts. We have to pull many levers in terms of program, policy, human rights, financing. So this is all about figuring out what we need to do to get to the goal of ending AIDS by 2030. And we're going to get an update to find out where our countries in Asia and the Pacific at. And we have another goal for today's session. We want to take a deep dive into the issues facing young key populations in the region. For some time now, the data have been telling us that this is a crisis. We have an issue to attend to, a, a huge red flag is being waved, and we're going to find out a bit more about what's the nature of the challenge, as well as the solutions. And for that, we've brought together a panel of young people young key populations. There's nobody here that's over the age of 30. Uh, so they're going to help us go through the numbers and offer some context, contextualize and figure out what are we dealing with and how do we move forward to address this issue. So I start by handing over to Eamon Murphy, who is the Regional Director of UNAIDS Asia Pacific and Eastern Europe Central Asia. He's joining us from Australia online. Eamon, welcome. Uh, good morning and good evening, depending on where you are across the region. Um, I'm going to share a few slides today um, before you hear from the young people on the panel, clearly I won't be on the panel, um, but it will be very good for us to just set the scene before we come and hear directly from young people's lived experience, both of um, working at country level, but more importantly, what are the collective regional issues that they want to share with us? So if we could start the presentation, please, um, Cedria. Are we right with the video? Right, here we are. So colleagues, let me just start. The, the new report, and I encourage you all to have a look at it. We will share a slide set, which includes this presentation and more um, afterwards, but please do have a look at the report. The new Global AIDS report tells us that the path to ending AIDS is clear, but it's the action to achieve this that is the real challenge for us. The responses that succeed are anchored in strong political leadership, 
to do four things, to tackle the inequalities holding back progress, to enable communities and civil society organizations in their vital role in the response, make them a true partner in implementation, in delivery, in understanding the epidemic and monitoring, to ensure sufficient Recording and sustainable in progress. Fi finance. And finally, it also calls on us to scale up the evidence-based HIV prevention and treatment. We're here today to review the latest evidence from the Asia Pacific region. In particular, we seek to understand more clearly what the data are telling us about the risks, the realities and the needs of young populations. That's the men of sex with men, people who use drugs, sex workers and transgender people in the 15 to 24 age range. The slide before you shows that in 2022, there were an estimated 6,500,000 people living with HIV in the Asia Pacific region. And among all the UNAIDS regions, it's the second highest number of people living with HIV after Eastern Southern Africa. There were an estimated 300,000 new infections last year and 150,000 AIDS related deaths. Far too many, both new infection and deaths, given the science, the ability to respond. In our region, 4.2 million people were on treatment, far below what we need. In 2022, more than three quarters or 78% of people living with HIV were diagnosed. Almost two thirds of people living with HIV were on treatment, 65%. And 62% of people living with HIV had achieved viral suppression. The regional averages on the right of this screen show that for men and women, the levels are about the same, but we are nowhere near the targets, as you can see from this slide, that we need to achieve for any of these areas to help control HIV AIDS as a public health threat. The average treatment coverage for the region stands at 65%. There's been no increase since 2021 and the region lags behind the global average, which is 76%. If we could move to the next slide, please. There are huge variations between countries. While Cambodia, New Zealand, Thailand are treating more than 80% of people living with HIV, as you can see here, quite a number of countries are not even reaching half of the estimated number of people living with HIV in their country. And look, to the reds, the yellows and the early greens, we have a lot of work to be done at country level to pick up the pace to achieve the treatment coverage needed. This includes Bangladesh, Indonesia, Iran, Mongolia and the Philippines. And three countries covered less than 30% of people living with HIV last year, as you can see on this graph. Then in this slide, you'll see the pink shows the number of people who have been diagnosed but are yet to receive treatment. They're not accessing the treatment they need in a whole range of countries. The key priorities for achieving the testing and treatment targets are to ensure early treatment initiation and to retain people on treatment to achieve viral suppression and undetectable viral load. When people on antiretroviral therapy achieve the viral undetectable viral load, they are unable to transmit the virus sexually. The concept, as we all know today, undetectable equals untransmissible or U equals U. We see that some countries such as Bhutan, Cambodia, China, Thailand have mastered this linkage to care, getting 90% or more of people who are aware of their status on treatment. But others, including Afghanistan, Fiji, Indonesia, Iran are not yet testing, uh, treating, sorry, 60% of the diagnosed number of people living with HIV. So these are people who know they have HIV and unable for different reasons to access the services. Between 2010, but this marks, masks a huge range between countries, as you can see in this slide, from those who are declining at high rates, like 77% in Nepal, through to those in countries with, in the red with seriously rising epidemics. To end the epidemic, we need to significantly slow the stream of new infections. If countries do not take decisive action, we are at risk of seeing a reversal in the prevention gains. The slide here shows Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Fiji, 
Papua New Guinea and the Philippines with rising infections. And in the Philippines, five times increase in the last period. We also know that the, the infections are largely amongst men. 70% of new infections in 2022 were among men. But it's also important to make sure that the programming targets at-risk women and those in need of services. New infections in the region are concentrated among key populations. We've known this for some time, that hasn't changed. In 2021, 96% of new infections were among key populations in their sexual partners. Here in this graph, you can see that most of these cases are on, among, among men who have sex with men, 46%. According to the report, MSM, transgender people and people who inject drugs have not benefited equally or sufficiently from HIV prevention. And this is a significant challenge for countries in our region. To end the inequalities affecting key populations, we must also apply policy and programmatic solutions that work while removing the structural barriers. The report tells us that new infections in epidemics that are among that are concentrated among key populations are not declining globally. Access to combination prevention and treatment services among key populations remains limited across most of the world. However, we are seeing faster declines among some key populations in some countries. As you can see here, this is a complex set of graphs, but you can have a look at these after just to see a few examples of countries in our region. But some groups are doing better than others, and it depends on the country. So we need to be looking at the mix. Where is the epidemic occurring? But where are the targeted programs also being matched or not? Of particular concern for our region is the rising epidemic amongst gay and other men who have sex with men in several countries and the slow decline in others. Next slide. Pre-exposure prophylaxis. We all hear about it. PrEP. It's the antiretroviral therapy taken by an HIV negative person to avoid contracting the virus. This graph shows you the differences across the region in implementation and uptake. PrEP has serious potential to markedly lower new infections as we've seen in Australia and New Zealand. In Australia, the state of New South Wales, what its most popular state, is looking seriously at being able to end AIDS as a public health threat. They're looking at epidemic control, and PrEP is a significant part of this um, success. We need countries to pick up the pace and transition from pilot projects to national rollout. The efficacy is proven. There's no time to waste. We will not see the expected payoff unless it is actually implemented at scale in the populations of need. The same structural barriers that affect other prevention services and testing and treatment also create barriers for the provision and uptake of PrEP. 70% of the estimated global need for opiate agonist therapy and opiate substitution programs is in our region. And you can see here in this slide, at the bottom, most countries have very low or medium coverage, reaching less than 40% of the people who inject drugs. And we know the whole variation of what's happening in the drug scene across the region and its impact on HIV. And the, co the, um, the, the, the intersectionality of drug use and sex in uh, HIV transmission is critical. So we need programs to target a whole range of areas um, for the use of drugs. The top part of this slide shows that needle and syringe exchange services are also at low to medium levels in several of the countries and not very high in most. We cannot end AIDS among key populations unless we effectively address the societal factors that increase the vulnerability and block the ability to access services. Repealing laws that criminalize or otherwise discriminate against key populations is an urgent human rights and public health imperative. According to the report, knowledge of HIV status and rates, the rates of viral suppression are, were lower in the countries that criminalized same-sex same -sex sexual acts or drug use. In Asia Pacific, 38 countries criminalized some aspect of sex work, 17 criminalized same-sex relations, 24 criminalized drug possession, 19 still criminalize HIV transmission, exposure, or non-disclosure. 
And even if it's not implemented, that law is critical to keeping some people away from services. And 15, restrict the entry, stay or residence of people living with HIV. Access to HIV related legal services must be ensured and the communities need education about their rights. Stigma and discrimination has a profound negative impact, as we know, on the health and well-being of everybody, but particularly of key populations and on the success of AIDS responses for these groups. These are a number of examples from different countries to show the variations across our region. And according to the report, people living with HIV who perceive high levels of stigma and discrimination are more than twice as likely to delay enrolment in care until they're very ill. Our region has also, like the rest of the world, seen economic jobs, including the impact of COVID, which is still being felt, but has threatened the world's ability to mobilize the essential resources needed to end AIDS. Countries must summon the political will to apply the resources available. They need to make the essential AIDS investments. In addition, the donor and development base for AIDS and health must be expanded or at least maintained. Funding patterns that contribute to HIV inequalities must be corrected. Resources available for the region are far lower than the investment required to achieve the 2025 targets. And in the next slide, you'll see very clearly Asia Pacific investments in prevention and the societal enabler programs for key populations fall far short of the estimated total share required. And you can see a whole range of countries on the slides. For Asia and the Pacific, we have four priorities to reach the 2025 targets. They're on the next slide and they focus on the first of these is the focus on key populations. And that's clear from uh, our presentation and the discussions today to modernize HIV service delivery. In far too many places, we are seeing old fashioned programs that do not reach those who are at risk of HIV or in need of services today to eliminate the equitable program coverage barriers and to mobilize sustainable domestic financing and look at integration where possible. COVID, we saw many investments and we saw many improvements in public health programs. They need to be maintained where they had a positive impact for HIV. We're gonna turn now to look at the key issue for today. There are many issues in the report, but importantly, the issue of young key populations. We need to focus in on what the situation is and we're gonna hear from the very good panel who are gonna share some ideas and I hope we're gonna see lots of comments and questions in the chat to stimulate this discussion. Across the region, new infections among young people declined by 22% between 2010 and 2022. But this trend is not strong enough to end the region's epidemic by 2030. And remember, every young person who contracts HIV requires treatment, care and support for life over several decades and to end AIDS, we need to slow the flow of new infections. The young people aged 15 to 24 represent only 15% of the region's population. In some countries, this is a significant boom in, in terms of population growth. Young key populations, the men who have sex with men, people who use drugs, sex workers and transgender women in this age group are yet an, a, a very small fraction of the youth population. But together with their sexual partners, as you see here, these key populations account for 26% uh, of all new infections in Asia and the Pacific. And you can see the, the breakup between different age ranges here. The priority for us is to target young key populations. In the next slide, we see in Cambodia, Indonesia, Myanmar, Lao PDR, the Philippines and Thailand, that youth from key populations and their sexual partners make up around 50, around half of new infections. So that says something to those making programming decisions. Where do you need to invest and who do you need to work with? In the next slide, we see that since 2010, new infections in the 15 to 24 age group have risen in Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Fiji and Papua New Guinea and the Philippines. We have some serious issues that need to be addressed in these countries and a lot of support is required from a whole range of partners. The graph in the next slide shows that young key populations also have inadequate access to prevention services. 
You need to take time, have a look at the slide later and unpack and see what's happening in different countries by different population groups. So a lot of rich information available that you'll see there to the left. We need them to move to the right of this slide. The, we have six key recommendations for policymakers and HIV programs to address the challenges that young key populations focus. And I hope we're going to hear from our panel their perspectives and the differences they would see. On the screen, you can see for yourself the six areas. HIV prevention programs and funding to focus on young key pops. To engage the community, the youth-led organizations in all aspects, planning, implementing, and monitoring of programs to ensure they're inclusive and understand the new issues that face young people today. Adopt differentiated service delivery methods to meet the needs and realities of YKP, including maximizing the use of mobile technology, social media, and telemedicine. Meet young people where they are, not where we think they should be or where the programs are based. We need to reach out to where people, young people live and are active. Make access to PrEP, harm reduction, condoms, self-testing kits easier for young people. Remove the human rights barriers by reforming laws and policies hampering access to services and to collect and use the disaggregated data on young KPOPs for advocacy and for program design and implementation. It's got to be a true partnership with young key population organizations and individuals in all countries. But you can see from the report and the details when you look at your own country, what the issues are telling you for yours. Cedrian, um, I'll hand back to you for the interesting discussion with the panel. I look forward to the discussions and, and, and the, the questions and participation of the audience. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Eamon. And of course, you'll have access to these reports online, hard copy, so you could take a closer look at the numbers. But the essential takeaway, 26% of new infections in Asia and the Pacific happening among young key populations between ages 15 and 24. And we've seen that in some countries, a high proportion of their new infections are among young key pops, around 50%. And in other countries, the new infections among young key populations have been increasing steadily since 2010. So those are the numbers we keep in, keep in mind as we segue into a deep dive into what are the challenges exactly and how do we work together to address them. We'd like to start with a short animated video to help us contextualize the issue. Young people, particularly young key populations and their sex partners, make up a considerable proportion of the new HIV infections in the Asia and Pacific region. Young key populations frequently experience stigma and discrimination, often in the context of punitive laws, age of consent laws, and harsh social taboos. This makes it difficult to stay safe and healthy, and it heightens their exposure to HIV. Efforts to prevent HIV among young key populations are not yet adequate. Differentiated HIV services designed to cater to the specific needs of young key populations are still unevenly available. Despite these challenges, youth-led organizations are stepping up to bridge this gap. Let's hear the experience of Manuel from the Philippines. As a young gay man, I have experienced discrimination that made me afraid of going to seek HIV services. But after finding Love Yourself, I am much more confident in my own health as I can easily obtain condoms without any judgment. Best of all, I use the online app Safe Spaces PH that helps me find condom distribution points near me. Partnerships between government and community-led organizations, especially at the local level, are vital to bring about youth-friendly services. Communities also help to advocate against discriminatory laws. Thanks to their strong activism, law reforms have been done in countries like India, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. Despite the key role that they play, youth-led work is not sufficiently funded. Tell us more about the needs of youth-led organizations, Kim. Youth-led organizations mostly rely on external funding. The youth programs will be under threat if resources continue to shrink. Youth Lead, the regional young key populations network, is empowering youth organizations to push for our priorities in national projects proposals. 
and to diversify funding sources for sustainability. We will not be able to end the AIDS epidemic in the region without putting and the important actions to take in the new publication from UNAIDS, UNICEF, UNFPA, and Youth Lead, putting young key populations first. Wonderful. So let me introduce our esteemed but youthful panel. Ika Novianti is the regional coordinator at Youth Lead, and Youth Lead is the Asia and the Pacific Young Key Population Network. They provide grassroots organizations with advocacy and programmatic support to improve their communities. Next to her is Karahana Marianne. She's the media campaign and communication coordinator for Gaia Warner Lentera Indonesia, GWLINA for short. And this is a national network of gay men and other men who have sex with men and transgender women that strengthens the capacity of community-based organizations to build better HIV prevention programs. Next to them, Warapot Yodpet. He's an associate project officer at UNESCO Bangkok, and he supports UNESCO's work on education for health and well-being and comprehensive sexuality education in the Asia and the Pacific region. And joining us online is Mac Roussel Cabuso. Mac is an advocacy officer for the Lacan Network, which is a coalition of government and community-based HIV and TB facilities in central Luzon in the Philippines. Lacan implements innovative strategies to increase young people's access to prevention, testing, and treatment. So I will start with Karahana. We've heard that GWL INA serves transgender women, gay men, and other MSM. And um, my question is, what puts young people from these communities at higher risk of HIV infection in the context of Indonesia? Uh, thank you very much. Probably I would like to start with one of the m m most fundamental uh, problem we have back in home in Indonesia is the lack of proper sexual education on formal education or places. So uh, usually people are getting information about sexual health, reproductive health from the internet or uh, by finding themselves. Or organization will go and give them information regarding that. But in formal education places, they will never get the information such as that. Even if there exists such kind of education, uh, the number is still very low. The next reason I would say is uh, the stigma and discrimination, uh, even on a systemic level that hinders young key population, such as like gay men, uh, male sex with male, and then transgender women, that hinders them from accessing health facilities, as well as get a proper education and then get a proper job. Even if even the thought of um, getting the health facilities send a shiver down to their spine, for example, like that. Even me, this come from experience, if I have to go to access health facilities, there is a there is a um, sense of afraid that I might get discriminated against because of who I am, my identity. And then also, um, like uh, Emman said beforehand in the slides, there are also discrimination in terms of age. So in Indonesia, under 17, a uh, young, uh, young population cannot access the health facilities for themselves. If they want to access that, uh, they have to be accompanied by their parents. But thankfully, we are working on a new regulation that said if you're under 18 or under 17, you can have a guardian or someone who accompany you to the health facilities. doesn't have to be your parents, and then you can access the health facilities. And Regarding the last one, uh, the, the stigma and discrimination that hinders them from getting a uh, proper job, many trans women, gay men, and male sex with male have to resort on sex work as a, uh, uh, for, for helping them economically. And that one uh, is combined with the election is rising between them. And can you paint a picture? Tell me what are some of the things people experience when they present to a clinic for services? Sorry? What are some of the experiences people have when they approach a clinic for health services? Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, based on my own experiences and also some of the experience that we gather from the young uh, uh, gay men, sex, male sex with male, as well as transgender women, especially for transgender women, whenever we're accessing health facilities, 
the moment we step our foot into the health facilities, people will give us a weird look. So it's because how we present ourselves first. And then after that, uh, on some, I'm not going to generalize everyone, but like on some health facilities, they would go straight into the point that, oh, of course, you're on higher risk. You're a transgender woman. You're a male sex with male or you're a gay man. That is one of the um, more, uh, one of the experiences that we're getting from accessing health facilities like that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Ika, on to you. You started your career as a sex, young sex worker advocate. Could you give us a sense of what are some of the challenges that sex workers experience specifically? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Sandra. Um, okay. I think, um, yeah, sex workers face both of health and human rights uh, challenges, I think. Um, it including high turn to HIV and also STI risk, um, criminalization of sex worker, uh, economic pressure, um, and social stigmatis uh, stigmatization were um, associated with the uh, increased prevalence of, um, of violence. Uh, power imbalance between sex worker and their clients um, lead to the sex work uh, not being able to, to sever um, practice to reduce HIV uh, infection. This is especially true for younger sex worker when they, they don't have, uh, they're not empowered yet to, to, to voice out such demand. Um, for younger sex worker, it happened uh, in many countries that when we are not married yet, so we cannot uh, access for the contraception um, services. It led to be, um, it led to the un unwanted pregnancy, and also um, there is no safe abortion available in the country in, in most of the country. Um, yeah, most, most of the sex worker also are forced to quit the sex work. Um, I think here we need to we need to understand that. All, that not all the sex workers, they are the victim of the human trafficking, but there are uh, also a sex worker and young sex worker who choose to be a sex worker. Okay, so there's a group of issues that affect sex workers in general, but it comes more intensified when somebody is younger, has less knowledge, is maybe less empowered. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to go online now to Mac. We've heard that Philippines has the fastest growing HIV epidemic in the region. New infections among men who have sex with men increased by six times since 2010. So please give us an idea of what's happening on the ground. What are some of the dynamics that are driving this increase in HIV transmissions? Thank you so much. So there are several factors why young key population or young people contributes to the proportion of new infections, uh, especially here in the Philippines. Some of these are first, young people believe that they are not high risk. Uh, due to the lack of HIV knowledge, uh, lack of comprehensive sex education in and out of the school, sex education and HIV are still a very taboo topic to discuss. In result, our young people believe that they are not part of high risk. And then secondly, they have no idea where are the HIV related services. Up until now, we don't have an enabling environment that empowers the young key population to um, awareness and link them to services that we have. Thirdly, HIV-related services are not available for them and in their area. There is still age restriction in accessing PrEP and condoms among young people. They still face discrimination or being questioned by service providers why they access these services, where in fact, these service providers should establish safe space in providing these services to them. Another problem about accessibility is HIV-related services are not available in their area. Most of the local government units in the Philippines don't prioritize HIV-related services. It may be existing in their rural health units, but the health worker or service provider who provides the services is not capable to provide holistic care to a young people or young MSM who wants to avail these services. And Social media platform urge AYKP to explore more on what they see. Social media is a double edge. Ed, I'm sorry. Uh, social media is a double edge sword. For one, social media enables young people to get easier access to HIV information, like uh, digital campaigns, promotions, and also services like HIV self screening, what is prep, telehealth, and other services. On the other hand, social media platforms are being used by young people to involve in a risky sexual behavior 
or activities like the usage of Twitter by posting adult contents or using Grindr to quickly uh, get preferred sexual partners. And lastly, the lack of HIV response strategies that are YKP targeted or YKP centric. Um, our program implementers should or must understand that young people have specific behaviors and needs and that we are not a homogenous sector. They need to level off their messaging to the understanding of an YKP. Our limited participation in um, HIV programming really contributes to this gap. The lack of community consultations with the YKP minimize our power to demand from duty bearers. Okay. And Mark, to what extent is chemsex a factor? We keep hearing about this increase in the use of recreational drugs during intercourse. Is this a phenomenon in the Philippines? And uh, what's your sense of the extent to which social media is both a risk factor as well as an opportunity? Um, you managed to test JKT campaign. This was initiated with support from the APCOM um, Foundation and it encourages young people to access HIV services, including testing and a PrEP. Yes. So question to you, how do you design a brand identity and content that actually capture the attention of young people? Okay, thank you very much. So like you mentioned before, it was initiated by uh, Giwel Ina as well as APCOM back in 2017. It was a sister um, project from Test BKK from for, as well as, as um, APCOM as well. And how do we create this brand identity is we focus on, uh, uh, we, we set our target audiences in the, the three main audiences. The first one is gay men, sex, uh, male sex with male, as well as transgender women, mainly aged from 18 to 34 years old. And then we're also people don't, uh, young uh, people don't get bored if they get information about sexual health all the time. And then as well, uh, we're keeping up with the trends. So we're not posting only about sexual health information, about PrEP, HIV testing. We're keeping on with the trend by posting our reels or tic in TikTok and videos as well. Also posting memes regularly. So maximizing the social media and the platforms we're pretty much on all platforms and we're uh, actively looking for the uh, place or the platform where people uh, young people are mostly interacting in and we're also doing fun project like we're going and visiting hotspot we're posting in on social media and letting people know that we're going in this place we're hosting this party and we'll come and we, we can give them not only give them the party that we will want but we're also giving them information about hiv testing as well as prep and then uh, we're also giving away merch like this one I'm wearing now right now. It's our hashtag actually, and this is the big theme for our uh, prep project that have been rolling out since last year. The team and the hashtag is prep yourself. So it can mean also to prepare yourself, but also to get yourself a prep. I think that is it. And how do you convert like clicks and likes online? So, um, we used to work with Epic Indonesia and back then we're focusing on HIV testing and we have a link reservation embedded in our profile so whenever people click it they can have, uh, have a risk assessment before making a reservation to get HIV testing but uh, also the link is all using only risk assessment for PrEP because where it takes is actually by monitoring the number of people clicking and also making a reservation but as of right now we cannot really know about that the more people will access it although I cannot deny that there are some obstacles that we face is right we were facing right now but the number of people accessing is um, growing and in Indonesia up until July 2023 the number of people who are accessing prep is uh, 6,800 people uh, out of out from 18,000 people who are accessing the risk assessment link and making the biggest number for that is social media by 48.67 percent. Great, okay. thank you. Yes. Uh, so Ika, could you tell me a bit about how we build prevention, testing, and treatment services that are actually responsive to the needs of young key populations? Mm. Um, thanks, Adrian. As you can see in the uh, Eman uh, presentation before, so almost all the new, uh, new HIV infection in the region is come from the uh, among young key population. And in reaching out uh, the reaching out them, 
Um, and to do that effectively, effectively, it is crucial to create a safe space for where the young key population uh, are part of the solution. Uh, this can be done by the meaningful engagement of uh, young key population in um, e implementation and also designing and monitoring evaluation um, for the HIV services. Uh, youth lead, as you can, you might know that youth lead has developed a manual to train the uh, healthcare provider in the country uh, together with uh, UNAIDS. Um, the manual includes uh, the way to understand the diverse uh, characteristic of Yankee population and also how to do the uh, counseling, um, counseling and yeah, uh, and also intervention package that suit the needs of Yankee population. It's also an opportunity to build a service are, that are res respond responsive to needs uh, of Yankee population. So this is a training model. Warapot, we've, we need comprehensive sexuality education strategies that target young people who are out of school. So how can digital resources play a role in helping us to achieve that? Thank you. Thank you, Sidian. Uh, due to the lack of the proper uh, sexual ed sexuality education that mentioned by our panelists, Kanahara and Max, I would say the all resources support children and peer educator uh, in both formal and non-formal education to values about health and well-being around HIV. It's also equipped young people with skills for health-seeking and health-promoting. It's not just only provide the knowledge about how to protect themselves from HIV, but also discuss around relationship, gender equality, and also how to negotiate sex. CSE Digital Resources is an innovative solution to ensure the accessible and out-of-school online and offline learner. As mentioned by uh, Karahana, the TikTok video, our UNESCO Bangkok together with uh, uh, UNFPA, Asia Pacific, and also the global organization Advocate for Youth had adapted, has adopted nine amazing video on sexual education, on sexual education on amaze.org. Uh, to for using by educators and learners in Southeast Asian regions, uh, which including Laos, PDR, Vietnam, and also Thailand. Together with young co-creator, we uh, develop discussion guides for peer educators to use to educate young people and adolescents. Also, each each guide corporate and amazing video that we adapted. Uh, that can be used to supplement existing online and offline resources that peer educator may already be using to provide sexuality and reproductive, reproductive health information to young people. Great, thank you. Mac, give us an idea of the combination of services, interventions, and support that we need to serve young men who have sex with men. Thank you so much, Serdian. So, um, I believe um, we're, we're talking here the combination of a service as intervention and uh, nowadays it is uh, it is very seen that it is a digital intervention so the digital strategies can definitely help bridge and you know um, advocate education and services access gap among young key population or young people um, especially to innovations like uh, prep and self-testing, which we know are um, critical health intervention to, to control the HIV pandemic. For, for one, um, social media and mobile application are YKP's main information sources. As we all know, uh, this young gay population nowadays really depends on their phones and social media. So we, we, we capitalize um, on that by implementing digital campaigns to disseminate accurate and comprehensive information about HIV prevention. Uh, this includes uh, safer sex practices, to deliver uh, the, the messaging or how we deliver them because it is very important that who, who are your targets, what, are, what is the message, and when is the right time to deliver that kind of message. In my observation, engaging in interactive social media content, contents are more appealing to young audiences. In Lacan Network, which is my organization, organization here in the Philippines, for instance, our use of infographics, infomercial videos that we post online and online activities uh, in our campaigns and promotion encourage more engagement with our target audiences. This includes the young key population. As I mentioned earlier, 
that Twitter is one of the top used social media platforms of young people. And we've seen that engaging other influencers also provide, prove or provide to be an effective strategy in targeting the high-risk population. And secondly, digital platforms facil facilitate easier access among young people. This includes PrEP, self-screen test or the self-test or the self-screening kits. We also utilize um, telehealth for doc doctor consultation if needed and use digital platforms to facilitate ARV and PrEP delivery to clients. And lastly, we maximize the digital platforms for PrEP support and community strengthening, which is very also very important in this generation of young key population. Young MSM mostly connects, share experiences, um, seek advices and support on one another in social media groups and group chats. So we treat these platforms as safe space and where we find a sense of belongingness and reduce feeling of isolation and stigma. We recognize that digital platforms have limitations and solely depending on them hinder us to reach YKP's in resources limited area specific specific element and for providers and implementers to differentiate their approaches to YKP groups because again 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 we are not homogeneous sector our our needs are different we have different needs and we have difference too as a YKP okay Great. so online and offline make sure we're covering yes. all the bases Kara Hanna, we've spoken so much today about the importance of youth voices, youth visibility, and youth leadership. In the context of a broadly conservative culture such as Indonesia's, how do young transgender people in particular advocate for their rights? Okay, thank you. So maybe one thing that I would like to highlight here is how the rising of social media helps young trans women to advocate more to their rights. So the number of people accessing social media especially young trans women, giving them platform to voice their voices when back then they are unable to do that. Like back then, we don't, uh, the social media is not as big as it is right now. So people feel like it is safe for them to, save, to voice their opinions. There is this one misconception that uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot more of LGBT people out there than it was back then. But one thing that is wrong about that is people, there are, there's no rising of LGBT people. People are just more comfortable to show up as themselves and show up and showing who they are. So they are more comfortable showing up, they're more comfortable sharing their experiences, they're more comfortable speaking up for themselves. And then the next one is, one of the tagline in Indonesia for Indonesian for the international one of the messages that the young transgender woman in Indonesia, along with a lot of the minority group in Indonesia, is trying to say and voice more. And uh, although there are obstacles like culture and then a discriminatory discriminatory uh, local government regulation, and currently right now what happened in Indonesia is the rising of the persecution due to the politic year because we're going into election as well as there is a recent um, incident that uh, hinder us from um, held, hold, uh, held the queer advocacy week but right now young trans women are more open to voice their voices because as one of my favorite saying goes if we cannot talk to them nicely might as well just make care so they listen thank you very much <laughs> got you yeah uh, Ika, in practical terms, how can youth-led organizations have a bigger say in the planning and the implementation and monitoring of policies and programs that affect their lives? Yeah, uh, uh, it is crucial to engage youth-led um, organization and young key population in the whole process of the HIV um, response. Uh, governments should create a safe, safe space, uh, space to consult with the young people and young key population um, in development of key guiding documents such as the National um, Aid Strategic Plan, um, funding proposal, uh, SOPs for the HIV service delivery, um, and other stakeholders should also engage the young key population and youth-led organization in joint monitoring and advocacy efforts. Um, for this to be in, in reality, a lot of mentoring will be needed for the young people. Um, special, specialized training for uh, and support need to give uh, to for the youth-led organization. Uh, young people face significant uh, challenge to challenge and barrier uh, to their meaningful uh, participation engagement. Um, 
This is including the age-based um, discrimination, limited uh, capacity, and understa understanding of the process, uh, inadu inadequate support and compensation, etc. Um, I think without a strong support and sustainable youth leadership in the HIV program, the voice uh, for the young population are not being heard, um, and the pro uh, leading the program. Uh, war report. You told us about these digital resources that UNESCO is working on um, to share comprehensive sexuality education messages online from people in all stages of the content development and dissemination process. Yes, thank you. UNESCO and our partner, we involve young people in the whole process of the discussion guide development. Uh, I would say central, centralize young people in the process of the education content development and uh, this uh, suggested by uh, as presented by Inan in the in the beginning I would say the process of the youth engagement on the whole process of the content development uh, could uh, diversify oh, UNESCO Bangkok together with the we, co we call them as a youth co-creator. We, we create the product uh, by uh, through the series of work topic. Uh, we, we involve young people uh, from the consultation process. So after that, uh, the youth who involved in both country consultation and also youth consultation, they led and their own project uh, using the content that co-developed with UNESCO. And uh, as a result, uh, they have influenced young people aged 13 to 24 years old. UNESCO has perceived young people as partners and Im involve them in program implementation, knowledge exchange and sharing learning, influence and advocacy and facilitation and coordination. Thanks so much. And you know, that's not just the question goes to Mac. What can members of the young MSM community do to protect themselves and to support their peers to stay safe? And we're not just thinking about protection in terms of HIV prevention, but also for people who are living with HIV. Uh, what are the steps that they need to take? Thank you, Sabrina. And so for me, I would encourage my fellow young MSM or male having sex with male, regardless of their HIV status, uh, to be proactive in educating themselves about HIV and accessing sexual health, uh, accessing sexual health services that best fit their lifestyle. If you don't have the, if you don't have HIV, then educate yourself about proper condom use, prep use, and regular HIV testing to protect, um, maintain undetectable status, and as much as possible, keep your preventive method when you engage in sex. Being passive does more harm than good. Let's take charge of our bodies of, or of our sexual health. Um, but of course, this is ideal, especially here in the Philippines. Young MSM will struggle to realize this without an enabling environment. Um, that empowers them to take charge of their health and access to HIV services. Therefore, um, enabling policies for sexual health education, uh, especially in school, uh, must be put in place. Quality HIV services must be made more available and accessible for us as a YKP. A safe and non-stigmatizing culture must be nourished uh, in education and health institution. And among people who work in these spaces, programs that combat stigma and discrimination should be leadership can change the game or we can really change our way or the game to the path that end aids. Uh, especially in better understanding the the behavior and needs of our population and uh, subsequently um, responding to them or responding to the needs of the population, especially the young key population. And when I talk about leadership, I don't really mean being consulted or having a seat at the table. Uh, as myself, as an advo advocate or advocacy officer in my organization, I started when I was 16 years old, when, wherein I don't have that much power, but I took the leadership that uh, this program needs. And I think that's the very important here when um, talking about leadership. And we want to be treated as co -ic. They are program implementers. They are, um, there are a lot of um, funding mechanism and also leadership and advocate. But we want to hold accountable our government in the Philippines, HIV. 
we cannot allow another generation of young people to get infected and struggle with this virus. Before we proactively and seriously act on it, the efforts of several local government units, community-based organizations, and key population groups can only do so much. We need a stronger power to effect systemic, uh, systemic change within the country's health system. We call upon the uni appointed DOH USEC Dr. Tedora Herbosa to firmly commit to President Ferdinand Marcos' challenge of containing the rapid HIV transmission among young Filipino people as soon as possible, while we, as an actor in the future, on the future steps of the HIV. And we must also demand accountability from those in position of power who can bring about system change. And I hope they hear our call on this uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, brilliant job, panel. Excellent. So we have just about half hour to have a discussion. If you have any burning questions, feel free to send them our way, and we'll have the panel field them. I'd like to introduce Dr. Otilia, who is the Strategic Information Advisor at UNAIDS here in Bangkok. So if there are any data questions, feel free to fire away. Um, we we'll, could have a mic moving around the room, and we could also welcome questions in the chat online. And we already have a couple. First, from Rita Widiadana, who's a journalist from Indonesia, and she's questioning how can we provide comprehensive sexuality education programs outside of school systems in Indonesia and other Asian countries. She's noting that even in the mainstream school systems, such programs yeah. then will take reflection. Sure, thank you very much for the question. I believe one of the problem causing that is because the sexual education or anything have to do with sexual is seen as still seen as a taboo thing in Indonesia. And even if someone trying to do that, we're going to be um, kind of persecuted or we're going to get trouble because of that. We're currently actually, um, the, the government is actually uh, revising the penal code. And um, in one of the, um, passage, it stated that whoever is giving information about sexual education, but they're not authorized, is, can be put in jail. So even, even if those kind of thing, even we're trying to give them information about that, we're still having problem because of that. But I think one, to the teacher, to the government, that this is not a, a taboo thing. This is actually something that's very important for us uh, to equip the children, to keep, equip the young generation about this, as well as to fight towards HIV and etc. And, and do you feel confident that even in that policy context, you'll be able to successfully do this work online? Um, I mean, we never know if we never try, but I believe that if we can do that, we can achieve a great success with that, yeah. And any other reflections from the panel? Uh, yes, uh, to uh, teach uh, children ab uh, out of school uh, learner about CSE, I would say we could. What we could do is like we create, we make available uh, resources that they can use it to incorporate the resources information, but re that ready to use offline learner. Peer educators, and tell me a bit about how these peer educators are trained and resourced. What's the framework for us having a network of peer educators? For the peer work together with uh, help promoting uh, personnel. I think it should be it can be a network or the person who already work in that community. So we kind of empower them, uh, give them resources. Uh, uh, yeah, somehow sometimes we somehow we can train them. But I think the key thing is like make the resources itself that available should should describe in the detailed way and and should educate them at the same time. Thank like you. Like give a concrete instruction to to peer educator to use the resources to integrate to their existing program. Great. And a data question, um, and this is specifically about the Philippines, coming from Lucille Sodipe. She would like to understand clearly, Philippines has the fastest growing HIV epidemic in the Asia Pacific region, but she's all you could tell us a bit more about what we know about new infections in the Philippines and the trend since 2010. Yeah, thank you for the question. We had a graph with, uh, with trends by country. Yes, if you can go back to that. 
Yes, there's so about four times increase in new infections since uh, 2010 to 2022. Also, what we see in the Philippines in the sta is a steady, uh, steady increase in uh, new estimated new infections among men who have sex of men, gay men and other men who have sex of men. And also, it's the most the fast growing epidemic in this population in the region currently. Uh, so we don't have this analysis by region, but we have globally uh, workers, but still it has an increasing trend in uh, uh, men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, and transgender. And so one question, because it does seem as though we're having some success with sex workers in many contexts. Ika, can you tell me a bit about what interventions have been proven to work to make sex workers more empowered and safer, d um, just based on past experience? Based on a past experience, since I'm not uh, currently, I'm, I'm working with the whole Yankee yes. population, right? Yes, I'm um, asking <laughs> you to go back to your advocacy days at national level. Yeah, with the sex worker, um, the capacity building is the first. Uh, the first is the, like to 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 have the empowerment to say for their client that they want to use condom, um, and also how to protect themselves of from the violence as well. Um, Strengthening for the sex worker uh, community, uh, as well as financing um, for the... And to Eamon, we've heard from these youth advocates, this, this battery of information, this package that is required, and there seems to be a very clear sense of what we need to do. How do we translate that into political buy-in, into political will to get this done? Thanks very much, Sedrian, from um, young people at the front line about what needs to be done. Definitely that political level is the critical part. Now, that's where the partnership has to come uh, together. It's about at the General Assembly in New York. And in that, there are a set of targets they've agreed to achieve. So collectively, at regional level with different partners and at country level with different partners, we need to be able to raise that with the right um, um, ministries and at the highest levels of government. And so the UN is one of those partners. There are international organisations, there are other countries uh, present at country level who are willing to take on some of these issues. So we need to collectively work with um, national organisations about who is best to raise it and how. Sometimes it's quiet advocacy, sometimes it's public, sometimes it's it's loud, it's in the street, so it varies. And that's really important that you have a do no harm principle as well, because the last thing you wanna see is some kind of crackdown on, on key populations in a country to, to best determine, but also at the regional level, because that peer um, comparison is really important and countries often look to each other. In our region, we have a really active group of ASEAN member states uh, in the health sector and um, countries um, present in Philippines, um, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, are all part of uh, ASEAN. That's another forum where the issues can and are being raised. And right now, ASEAN has put out its own regional statement, but it's now developing a roadmap. Of Thank you. And this is a question for Kara Hanna. We have a participant here from Africa, and he's saying we are faced with holistic transgender stigma because countries are still ruled with cultural values that don't recognize various sexual orientations and gender identities. So how can transgender groups be assisted um, because they're not consulted on any issues, especially healthcare issues? I believe that they're doing what they're doing right now, which is like voicing their voices, although they're faced with like so many obstacles, just like in Indonesia, where it is uh, uh, religion and also culture uh, obstacles hindering them from achieving bigger success. But I would like to say that um, doing what we're doing currently, voicing our voices and then like um, doing a coalition and uh, intersectionally, uh, intersectionally it with other issues is going to get our issues further because then the government or like people in power will have to listen to our voices because we keep making noises. Because back then in Indonesia, it is probably a bit safer for trans women, but we are not taken seriously. 
but for right now what's happening right now is we're under scrutiny but then people are listening to us more meaning we're doing something with that so what i would like to say that to that is actually just keep doing what we're doing and try to amplify it a little by little to get, to achieve a bigger success or bigger impact and question to everyone and mark i'll go to you first and care that young populations need in the absence of the kind of progressive government policy that we're talking about. Thank you so much, Sedrian. So the community-led, uh, the factor of community-led in, uh, in the context of young restrictions, or there are still some stigma and discrimination that a, uh, in the facility itself. So when uh, a community-led was um, uh, performed in uh, Waikiki, uh, we've seen that, in, in my experiences, we've seen that uh, the, the access of services was high up in uh, young people population than before because they've seen that the services are um, being offered near to them or the services are being offered by um, a YKP itself. And we've seen that um, providing these services in uh, the community of young people needs to be youth-led also. Uh, it is a community-led and youth-led, and we, um, when we ask some youth who avail the services, um, are you more comfortable on uh, accessing the services with a service provider or um, a youth, uh, a youth on providing it? And they said that most of the time they are comfortable um, accessing the services in a community level and a. Uh, a comment and question from Amrita Saka from the India HIV AIDS organization has developed some special operating procedures and white papers um, services. There are other necessary healthcare services, there are other necessary interventions that are required for key populations and she's specifying for um, transgender people, for example, gender affirming care. And so she would like to know from some of the colleagues on the panel um, if something similar is being done in their countries. So I'd, I'd like to start with Cara Hanna and then go back to Mac because she did specifically ask about the Philippines context where we have um, high new infections. Thank you very much. I, I really love this question, actually, because I do believe that for transgender people, especially transgender women, gender affirming care is one of the facilities that is being needed the most after their heart. So in our country, Indonesia, actually, they are still in talk. We're called Jaringan Transgender Indonesia, or Indonesian Transgender Network, as well as with Inti Muda is actually doing that. We're underway to I um, make that as, uh, happen as soon as possible. And we're actually really thrilled about that because finally, uh, after years of waiting, one of those uh, very important facilities is going to be happen in Indonesia. I know that we're still um, pretty far from its happening, but doing, uh, to, uh, having talk about it, having people in power listen to us talk about it, meaning there are 50% chance that we're already underway there, so yeah. And I, I like the optimistic note in everything that you say, Thank optimistic you and empowered. And just a, a quick note that we have a story on our website about the Tweet Foundation in India that's actually collaborating with government, with UN agencies to provide employer training, sensitivity training for transgender people. And they're actually doing job placements for transgender people, hosting job fairs, getting people trained and placed. So just to make the point that it's not just HIV services that key populations need. It's a whole spectrum of issues that have to be addressed. Mark, over to you. Give us an idea of what's happening in the Philippines in terms of comprehensive care um, and, and service delivery for key populations. Yes, um, as of this moment, um, there are lacking of comprehensive care for young people specifically, unlike before pre-pandemic. Uh, I myself started joining the program when I was 16 years old, and I still remember that I was part of a campaign of a one funder that is really specific for YKP, wherein the, the, the campaigns, the messaging, the information are YKP related. But as of now, when um, uh, during the pandemic and uh, until now, um, the YKP led um, comprehensive education or comprehensive services 
are not really seen as of today. And it is really a must to bring it back or to really empower more um, the YTP community by providing comprehensive health services. Because uh, we, we, we know that in the current data report of uh, in, in the Philippines, the primary or um, the, the infection of YTP here in the Philippines is um, hiding up or the percentage of um, touching and bring back the comprehensive health services that they did before the pandemic. Thank you. Okay, question to Eamon from Kunal Kishore. Given that responding to stigma discrimination and legal policy barriers are critical for preventing new infections among key populations, we should prioritize linkages with universal health coverage and the, the um, periodic report processes, the UPR processes. How can UNAIDS, along with the WHO and other UN agencies, support and prioritize this at the country level? Thanks very much, Kunal, for the question. Um, th this should be happening for the uh, UPR processes with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the UN country team. And so certainly that's definitely an issue that I know it's been raised in a number of uh, country reports. Um, the, the partnership is not just the, the usual UN co-sponsors that you're aware of as part of UNAIDS, but it's across any part of the UN system that needs to engage. So UPR is critical. We heard from um, our colleagues in Indonesia about new laws. We heard about the barriers in the Philippines, legal barriers. These are issues that need to be flagged when they come into the human rights uh, frame in, in the uh, UPRs. Um, the other part of your question, which is equally important, primary health care, universal health coverage. How do we integrate? Going forward, we need to see a really uh, a stronger public health model in the UHC agenda. And that's something we all need to collectively advocate for. Uh, WHO, uh, I saw some WHO colleagues online um, uh, in the session. They're working on, we were not a bit sideways, uh, I'd have to say, because of COVID and it needs to re-ignite um, around um, learning the lessons of COVID, not just HIV, and why we need to see in, as part of universal health coverage, a pandemic response, a public health response, which is engages community and the key part. Actually, we just had a number of conversations this week about the primary health care linkages and what um, we can do uh, more at the regional level together, WHO, UNICEF, UNDP, ourselves, and uh, UNODC, others. Um, so um, that will continue. But great question, Carol. Thanks. Thank you. Data question incoming. And this is specifically about Vietnam. Vietnam, could you comment on the new infection situation, especially among young key populations? So, uh, okay, so uh, we don't have Vietnam among the, on the list of the countries with uh, increasing trend in new infections among uh, youth, among uh, 15 to 24. Uh, we have uh, uh, country profiles. You can uh, visit the AIDS Data Hub. We will provide you with uh, the link uh, at the end of this uh, session. And you have the data country by country. And there you have the trends, all the most recent data on Vietnam, not only, but all countries that belong to the Asia and the Pacific uh, region. So uh, we saw the slides on the slides we saw that Vietnam is not among the countries with an increasing trend in new infections among uh, key population, young key populations. And um, just to bring you back to that. So uh, we have the same uh, trend. Uh, um, so this is uh, uh, applicable also, also to the younger age group. So, th but for more details, all the data that we call I use this opportunity to invite all of you to visit the aid available on the website. And uh, feel free, uh, do not never hesitate to contact us at UNAIDS Asia Pacific Regional Office. 
if you need. Uh, Wonderful. And so a great time to plug. Last year, um, we had the interagency task team on Yonkey populations, which is a coalition of community organizations and UN organizations working on the YKP issue. They published a report putting Yonkey populations first. Uh, lots of the same data. Things haven't much changed from one year to the other, but an excellent synopsis of the challenge where you can get a link to AIDS Data Hub, AIDS Data Hub that we're so proud of, but you could get links to the country profiles as well as the regional overview. So, you know, we'll make all these resources available for you afterwards. Um, questions to the room. Any burning questions from the audience here in Bangkok? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Abina Ahir and I'm uh, part of APCOM as a community. Um, congratulate all the young guns here, uh, you know, who are talking exclusively and uh, amazingly about the work that needs to be put in the regional uh, level. I just feel we know very little about young people. Uh, and I think it is time for us to really uh, expand our awareness about it and what language young people talk. A lot of provinces in various states still are not uh, privileged enough to have internet uh, or to have social uh, inter internet access. For those populations who are young, uh, how do we reach out to them? What is the uh, strategy that probably would be helpful for expanding the HIV interventions uh, uh, within those populations who are who are at the high risk but not living in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, urban territories and other related aspects. He said, we look spread across the young people. We have to encounter the sexual behavior, which is at the risk, right? Like, for example, we still have a data in the regional level, in fact, at the global level, that 40 to 60 percent of MSM are married to cis women uh, because of the societal pressures and other related aspects. So how do we, how do we work around with those aspect, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, young people. And uh, last question I have for ma'am, uh, specifically around data. We still see a lot of data. The countries fail to uh, document the data that they are supposed to document the way it is supposed to be documented. Or, uh, uh, or is there any other KPIs that we can introduce or indicator that we can introduce that help us to gather more efficient data on the transgender uh, people and also on gender-based violence. Thank you so much. Great. Three questions. Uh, let's take the data question first. Yeah, so all the data we have we get from countries. So, uh, so if this data are missing in our database related to transgender, it means that the country either provide the data that do not meet the quality criteria to be published or they do not have this data. So yes, it's a, but we have to, uh, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that I see across the region an increase of data availability on, uh, to, uh, to encourage communities to advocate uh, for um, data availability at country level using available funds, both domestic and uh, external funds to implement uh, good quality, satisfactory quality surveys that could inform the programs uh, yeah, so this is, um, yeah, so what is available it ca uh, on our website, the data available, they all come from country level. So Great. yes, and uh, once again, we encourage you to advocate at your country level for both domestic and external resources to have more investments in quality data. Without quality data, well, it would be difficult to inform uh, right programs. Over. Great. And Mac, I'll give you the last word for the afternoon. You did mention before that some of the work is online and some of the work is offline. Could you paint a picture for us of what that offline work, that in-person, on-the-ground work looks like? Yes. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sir Gigan. So I've, I've, as I've said earlier, we are very thankful, thankful that there is digital platforms. We can disseminate information as easy as we can. But let us also see the picture that there are some young key population who, do, who doesn't have any access with these digital platforms and they don't have that resources to use this or to, to be rich for the information that we post or we 
we do in digital platforms. And for us, it is very important to do the outreach activities with the integration of digital information and physical dissemination of information. We all know that, I mean, uh, we must use the, the technology or the, 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 the digital platforms in many different ways. And, um, and on, on the offline or in the community level, we must think that a lot of YKP or there are some still YKP that there's that they don't have any access of it. Thank you. So, um, you know, that's the end of our panel. Excellent job. Excellent job. So interesting, so concise, so insightful. I'd like to thank Ika, Karahana, Warapot, and Mac online. And also a word of thanks to our UNAIDS team, the data team, Otelia, Yeyu, and our SI advisors in the country offices who've made all this data possible. And also quick note of thanks to our admin support and our IT support for bringing us together today to share this discussion. Please connect with us on social media, UNAIDS Asia Pacific and online. All these resources are available for further inquiry, further discussion and further action. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much.